This podcast provides a platform for our guests to share their experiences and inspire our listeners to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams. As you listen, we invite you to explore how these concepts apply to your own story. You know what to do. Be great and be grateful. We're mic'd up with Mike DeChocho. Hey guys, bringing you a local Western New York favorite today, a phenomenal networker and connector, a serial entrepreneur building two six-figure businesses from the ground up by age 27. He's a keynote speaker teaching leadership to college students and businesses across the country. He's an author, N2 publishing franchise owner, and the host of Western New York Entrepreneur Podcast. Welcome to the show, my friend, David Schaub. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. It's an honor to be on here, and uh, I'm honored to call you a friend. We've been talking about this for a long time, and we've been uh, planning on, on getting together, and then the quarantine hits, right? And uh, it's just absolutely crazy what's going on right now, but I know previous to us uh, recording this, we were already starting up a little bit of a conversation on handling it and business owners and entrepreneurs pivoting. So let's start right there. How are you doing? And what are I, I have a ton of questions to ask about things you're working on, so let's kind of save those for a m- minute. But how are you doing personally just dealing with this, you and Amber at home? I know today's 50 degrees, guys, if you're listening to this. In Buffalo, it's like the first time we've hit 50 degrees since we've been trapped indoors. So I know you're planning on getting outside. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, I try to answer each question at a time here, but uh, <laughs> me and my wife are, are driving each other nuts, if we're being honest. Um, so we're driving each other. So when people post like me, my wife or me, my husband are, are doing amazing this quarantine, I'm like, well, is there something I don't know? <laughs> so uh, but that being said, I'm a very loud individual. So for those who know me, I'm very loud. And so I'm on the second floor recording this video. Mm-hmm. And it, it, she says, Dave, your voice pierces my soul from the basement. <laughs> you know what I mean? From the first order of the basement. So yeah. she can't escape me. And I'm on meetings all day. So <laughs> poor, poor Amber. And this is also a Saturday, guys. I know you're listening to this for the first time on a Monday because we do mic'd up Mondays. But Saturday, it's 50 degrees out, which is like summertime in Buffalo in the spring. Yeah. And Dave and I have agreed to do this thing. And I appreciate Amber. Let's give her a shout out for, for being cool to, to allow your voice to pierce through while she's <laughs> trying to get some stuff done downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, what's great about 50 degrees is that it's not too warm where I'm like, I don't know if we can do this today. It's the first warm weather of 2020. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're going to we're going to make a drive down to, to Erie PA to go to Krispy Kreme because she hasn't had that in a month. And uh, we're going to go through the drive through do our social distancing thing. But um, so to answer your question about pivoting, you know, for yeah. me, um, I own a franchise for a publishing company, as you alluded to, but we make 95% of our income off advertising. So as you know, advertising and publications probably is, isn't the greatest thing for business owners during this time, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can speak differently about that, but most people, so yeah, we're down 30, 30 40%. In fact, I haven't mm-hmm. done much with it the past month and I've totally pivoted to things. I guess I'll just say it this way. New problems, which we have a new problem, COVID-19. It's a completely different problem we've never really heard of in our lifetime, Mike, anyways, Mm -hmm. Mike. And so when there's new problems, there's new solutions that are needed. And when there's new solutions needed, that means there's new opportunities. New opportunities that are not going to be there before and definitely not after. So we're at a a crazy time for sure. But for me, I'm constantly asking myself the questions of, okay, like where are the new problems and how can my business or expertise or my services or anything that I can do good in a great way that can solve these problems. And how do you monetize that? How do you create more value? Or if you can't monetize it, no worries. How do you create more value that way when this is all said and done, people want to know who was there for them when in the biggest time of need. So that's that's what's flowing through my brain every single day. What I think is great too is new opportunity. I just wrote that down because when this thing hit, you know, there was kind of, I don't want to say there's only two groups of people and put people in a box, but there definitely was two ways of looking at it. There was, woe is me. I can't believe this. What am I going to do? Oh my God. And there was, how am I going to create something? Which it was kind of neat to see our friends and many mutual connections create things like Grow Buffalo, which I'll have you talk about in a minute. Um, you know, how to do the first online entrepreneurial networking event. Let's figure that out and make it happen and get a hundred people on and give money to City Mission. That's my next question. But my point is there's groups of people that kind of rolled down and, and kind of, you know, got steamrolled by the quarantine because they weren't able to, 
produce in some way. And there are people who created new solutions to problems that weren't existing 10 days ago and figuring it out. And that's the kind of people who we, you and I are hopping on Zoom calls with, collaborating with. Um, you have like four new things you're doing that came out in the last 30 days because you're an opportunistic person, which was the number one reason I wanted you on this show. And that was even before those four things came out. So the first one I want to talk about is this really cool event that you held. You should be extremely proud of it. I know you're, you beat yourself up like me and you want everything to be perfect the way it's created in our head, the time that we have the thought. We want to see it through. And you did a fantastic job. Unfortunately, I was not able to make it on that call. I know many people who were there. Tell us about it. Uh, the people tuning in, because this show is not only for Western New Yorkers, but many of them are. Yeah. If they weren't able to partake in this, I know there's opportunity for more in the future. What was the event? And tell us about how you connected it to a great cause. Yeah, so my whole goal was originally where, where this originated was um, when I first started the podcast over a year ago, I my end goal, that people like, what's your end goal of this podcast besides creating episodes? My end goal mm-hmm. is to do a 150, 200 person in, in person networking event where we have big speakers and you know, we well, I was gonna mm-hmm. do like an open bar for an hour and free food, and but uh, but you know, it'd be like two hundred bucks to go. So Buffalo never had anything like that. And I really wanted to create that. So really, my goal of building all these networking relationships to do that. However, when you know the whole pandemic hit, um, I never I maybe been on two Zoom calls my entire life before the pandemic hit. So I was not versed well versed in Zoom besides knowing how to click on a link. So that being said, my I got a good friend of mine, Kanishka. Um, he's like, I don't want to do zoom. He goes, and then a couple other people were just, just like, Hey, you know, I actually was Drew Serza, the founder of Buffalo chicken wing festival, where yeah. like 50,000 people come all over the country to go to it. He's like, Hey, <laughs> why wait till the winter? Why don't you just do one now, a big event now? And I just stopped there. Yeah. I'm like, sure. So, uh, that's where it came out of. And thank mm-hmm. God I, so basically I leverage what I'm, what I feel like I'm good at, which is influencing the gift of speaking, the gift of just building a vision around things, get people connected to it. And mm-hmm. I, I, I delegated who was really good at Zoom and they ran the Zoom call for me, which was Kanishka, yeah. a good friend of mine. Yeah. And um, so that's where that came out of. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to donate to something that's important, that's needed. So we teamed up with Buffalo City Mission. We donated about $1,000 to them. We donated every general mission ticket to them. Of course, we had some VIP packages and we had some business sponsors where, mm-hmm. you know, where I just built relationships with them. And um you know, we did a hundred person virtual networking event. So for those that are outside of Western New York, like mm-hmm. there's a huge opportunity that if you guys haven't done a hundred, 200 person virtual networking event, and you're in a big major, you know, let's say a big city, a top 100 populated city, I, I would go for it. And cause mm-hmm. no, I'm guessing no one's doing too many of those. And even if someone is, you can do met, like, just like when there was an in-person networking event, there could be two going on in the same city at the same time. There's different people, there's different ideas. Sometimes there's a theme behind it. Other times it's more general. Uh, I encourage anybody to, to use Zoom or whatever platform you want. There's other ones out there. I was using this for since I started my company in, in November of 2017. Um, I had a couple business partners in Rochester. So it's not that far of a drive, but it saves us an hour and a half. Call it a three-hour trip every day to hop on a call like this. I had people in New Jersey and New York City and stuff on my team. So we were able to like operate remotely. It was cool. And now even in, within a smaller network, it could be someone down the street. People are realizing how important it is just to hop on a call like Zoom. What I want to do too, you mentioned, I talked about it in the beginning, Western New York Entrepreneur Podcast. You talked about starting that about a year ago, a year ago with a goal of 150 to 200 people in a networking event. And you pulled it off essentially, you got in that 100 range in a whole different version of what you would have ever thought about, which is one, a cool story because that's what entrepreneurship is about. You know what? You don't just create this thing that's already in its final form when you're writing the idea, which is why I always encourage, and many of my guests have encouraged startup entrepreneurs to start, right? Because if you try to create whatever, maybe it's a star and I've I've used this analogy, like in the beginning, it's going to be a square and you might sell three of them. Then you reshape it to a triangle and you sell 12 of them, right? And then all of a sudden it's a circle and you knew that that's more of the product that people are looking for and you sell 2,500 of them and then you get to the star shape and that's just that's your moment of fame, right? You blow up and you sell this thing. You would have never got to the star if you didn't start the square. And your podcast is like you knew you wanted to get in front of people and network and, and use it as a 
leverage tool to meet more people. And you did, but you never knew you were going to get 100 people through Zoom, right? But if you didn't start your podcast a year ago, it would have most likely not happened, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to just commend you on is you were the first person in, in the Buffalo market, and maybe it's not true, but the first one I knew of that started a podcast here. And I came in shortly after you, and I'm sure there's many others, but uh, I just wanted to commend you on that because... Uh, it was something you and I were talking about and I saw you do it. So you, again, just like I talked about, started it. And I had people pushing me to do mine. And eventually I'm like, I'm going for it. Our <laughs> our, our themes are a little bit different. Yours is Western New York focused. And our mine is just a little bit more out to the to world. But so talk a little bit more about, um, you know, what your vision is for like the next step for Western New York entrepreneur. Yeah, so I'll make, I'll make a joke. I'll make fun of myself. I just make up stuff as I go. So for me, I have I have a big I have a big goal, you know, the, that big networking event. And I knew there was yeah. something I needed to get there. But for me, it's just solving problems that I noticed that are arising. Yeah. So I know, you know, I noticed that the same 80%, I don't know about you, but when I do networking around Buffalo, and maybe if you're in a major city, you feel the same way. You feel like the same 70% of people are at the same network event all the time. I'm like, uh, I think I'm meeting this. If there's 30 people there, I know the 20 and I saw them twice at another networking event, right? So I'm sitting here like the same circle is basically there. Nothing wrong with that, but I want to meet more people. So I noticed something like that when I was doing more networks. I want to solve that problem. And what's really cool is when I do my networking events, I don't know half the people that are there, Mike. So I'm like, this is cool because if I don't know them, I'm guessing other people don't know them as well. So it's been a really cool way to do that. So for me, it builds a personal brand around everything I do. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, it builds trust. It builds like, hey, I'm a real person. I'm not this guy in a cubicle and, uh, you know, and like Maine <laughs> doing yeah. this. Yeah. Um, so it just really does that. So for me, I'm just making these as we go. Like we just created hats for the uh, podcast. I love them. them. Yeah. Those really, are sharp. We can call this a movement because I, I call this a movement. I don't really call it a podcast anymore. It's the Western mm -hmm. Entrepreneur Movement. We're just helping entrepreneurs and business owners locally in Western New York, whether it's Rochester, mm -hmm. Buffalo, Syracuse, the Southern Tier, as far as Jamestown, New York. We're just helping you take next steps. We're interviewing other thriving entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to, to help you take next steps. And uh, that's that's kind of our whole goal. And we're going to do that through an array of community events with businesses and entrepreneurs. And um, it's just it just really, it's just all under that umbrella. And, it, and uh, things change, things pivot. And uh, so that's, that's basically what I'm doing. And like I said, I'm just making this up as I go. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, you know what though? Again, you're doing it. You're you're absolutely active, and you're you're as I also mentioned in the beginning of the show, you're a networker, but also a connector of people. I've met people through you at your last event that we were able to do in person. You talked about Kanishka. He helped you get that hundred person virtual networking event off the ground. He's also partnering with me on a project. I met him through you, but you didn't say Mike meet Kanishka. You just said Mike, hang out with me. And there's people here that you could benefit from meeting. And now we're mutually benefiting, Kanishka and I, from hanging out together, now starting a new business venture together, which is super cool. And I know you have one with him as well. Why don't we go right into that? So the name of that, I'm going to, I'm flying down a few questions. Um, you guys have the website. It's it's launched and it's active, right? Is it, it businessinquarantine.com? Is that what it is? Yeah, I apologize. I interrupted you. It's uh, businessinquarantine.com. And we just launched the beta website. So really, we're just in the right. collective information form. So Business in Quarantine is just a movement of where we can learn from different businesses in specific categories all over the world and how they pivoted and what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. So we want failures. We want successes. We want everywhere in between. You can post anonymously because you're like, well, I had a huge failure, but I don't want to be too public. You can totally post anonymously. But what's cool is that once we collect thousands and thousands of forms, we now, mm -hmm. when you go to the website, once we launch the whole website, you can see what specific industries in your business, like, you know, for example, whether it's maybe it's podcasting, maybe it's manufacturing, maybe it's doctors, maybe it's dentists, maybe it's chiropractors, maybe it's digital marketing. You can see what has worked for them and what hasn't worked for them during this time. Yeah. So it's like collaborating, but on your own time in a very less timely manner. And it's candid. Like you said, I actually looked at that beta site last night. There's questions on there to give you very specific things that you can that you learn from already that you're like, it's kind of like doing one-on-one -on -one Zooms with a lot of people, but it's putting it together in a catalog or a yeah. database. It's like a database of entrepreneurial problems and you can go and view it and learn like 
what you can yeah, take. It's like, it's like seriously collaborating without all yeah. the hours of Zoom calls. It's yeah, really, it's cool. so you know, for me, I love learning from other people's mistakes. Not just, I make a lot of them. Ask my wife, right? So, but, but, but that being said, I love learning from other people's mistakes. I like learning yeah. from other people's ideas and successes. We can make them our own. And you made a great point before this, Mike. Edison, Thomas Edison created the light bulb, but there's been a thousand mm -hmm. different improvements. So for us, this is the light bulb. Oh, this really works. Let me improve on that. Let me put my own spin on it. Let, let me make that idea my own and create it in my business in my specific industry or area. So mm -hmm. for us, this saves so much time. It's like you can literally go to like, oh, I have a hundred other digital marketing people if I'm a digital marketer. I can see what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. It's like that saved me so much time and right. I can see what's working in different parts of the world. So yeah. um, I think it's, like, it's almost like a research website in a way, but yeah. without doing the research, it's like already done for you. Yeah. I was thinking about putting together a book that was, that takes like things I learned from my guests of the show and kind of releasing it in a book and maybe they could have like written responses to it, something like that. But I think the idea of it being digital is more accessible too. And it can update quicker. Like you can add people in at any time. When a book comes out, it's out. You can do a version two. It's a lot of work. I, I really like the idea of a website because it's interactive. We actually stole that idea from Humans in New York. Oh, really? So yeah. There's a website called Humans in New York. Where it's I was hoping there was a website or something because I thought it was very odd for you. Instead of saying people in New York, humans. Oh, is it York. people? I thought it was human. No, right. no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like, okay. you, like <laughs> I learned something from this human in New York. It just, oh, no, the oh, name yeah. of the company is humans in New York. I'm just. I'm yeah. Just, so we honestly, like I said, like 90% of my ideas are not originally mine. Like maybe I had like 2% of the idea, sure. but I needed someone to give me the idea. So for me, what's really, what, when people ask me, Dave, what has made you a very successful entrepreneur? Like hmm. it's implementation. It's implementation. It's it's, it's not having the best idea, the most creative mind out there. Those are great. But you know what? If you're not, I'm not a very creative person, um, Mike. I would never call myself a creative thinker. What yeah. I do, though, is when I'm very passionate about something, when I think oh, that's an amazing idea, I act on it immediately. Like, I will work eight hours on it immediately. Mm -hmm. And I implement it. So one of my favorite sayings is, now, knowledge is not power. That's complete BS. It's use of knowledge is power. We can hear all the information's out there. It's just who's going to act on it, who's going to move on it quick, who's going to, you know, who's going to have a, who's going to act on a good plan today versus a perfect plan tomorrow. So, yeah, it doesn't do it. That book doesn't do any good on the bookshelf. You have to read it and then do it in the book that you can learn and apply it to life, right? So here's what I want to do is there's some people that don't know some of your backstory, and you and I were able to um, when we met, we you were very transparent and I appreciate it and opened up about your story. You told me about uh, your journey in sales, how it led you to be an outside salesperson. Then you got into N2 publishing. You do, you do public speaking at uh, universities and things like that as a keynote. But I want to go back to and one of the topics I talk about because I know many of our listeners, our audience is going through some adversity. It could be personal adversity. It could be business adversity. A lot of times it's, there is no divider there. So um, I appreciate, you know, if you can open up here, one, one of the things that's like a prerequisite for entrepreneurs, almost inevitable, is that moment where they have to overcome some kind of adversity. You, you had some early on in life. So you grew up fatherless, right? Arrested four times. You worked a dead end job for a long time, kicked out of college with a 0.86 GPA all before your 20th birthday. So tell us, was, was there a moment or a spark, maybe a fire that was lit within you that allowed your personal growth for change? How did you turn those things into a positive change? Yeah, you know, a lot of times it comes down to a defining moment, right? And a lot of us don't make changes until unfortunately we hit rock bottom, right? Like, you know, for those that catch it early, you know, that's amazing. But I would say most people only mm -hmm. do it when they absolutely have to. And so for me, my, my, my moment was when I was 20 years old, um, I, I, I was arrested. I actually beat up a kid at a house party and I, his uncle was a Supreme Court judge for 44 years. So I hit the wrong kid. So my Lord, you, you hit the wrong kid, you know, and I actually got a felony for it. I got a record for it because his uncle had a lot of leverage and I was just a no name kid that sure. came from a single mom of you know, five, you know, five kids. And, you know, we didn't really have the best lawyer. We couldn't afford one. We were just that being said, um, I went, I did six months of weekends. So I did, so I literally drove myself to the holding center on Friday mm -hmm. as a 20 year old and then drove home on Sunday. I called them my weekend getaways. And 
So is, is, is a joke, right? And so I missed my my birthday. And it was, this is during the summer when everybody's having fun. It was really yeah. tough for me. So you had like, to go and do community service. Is that, am I understanding it right? So, so community service is completely different from that. So I had to do a hundred, a couple hours, hundred hours of community service, but yeah. every weekend for six months, you literally drive yourself. To, you literally just go into the holding center and you literally are sitting in a jail cell for 72 hours. But they only made you do it on the weekend. Weekends. They call them weekends. Wow. So a lot of people that get DWIs have multiple DWIs or they're not as harsh of a crime to, to do full straight time, or maybe it's their yeah. first time. So for me, you know, um, that's what I, I that was my wow, I never knew about that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. All right. And so anyways, um, one of the, I was about probably three, four months into doing my, my way weekends and mm-hmm. I had a six months since about three, four months into it. And I, uh, my sister at the time, she's 17 now. She's probably, I was thinking she was five or something at the time. I don't know. I was, sure. I was young. Yeah. I'm 32. This is when I was like yeah. 20. So that being said, I came home and I said, you know, when you are locked up in a cell for 72 hours, you miss everything. You're annoying little sisters, you're, you know, everyone. So I literally got home and I said, Hey, Natalie, she came to the door. She goes, Hey, and I'm like, Hey, uh, give me a hug. I miss you. And she goes, go back to jail. And she literally laughed like nothing happened, ran away in her little footy pajamas. And she has no idea the damage she just did to like my heart, but she's yeah. kidding. She totally devastated me. Yeah. And I went down to my basement cause I, I was a single, I was one of five kids. I was the oldest of five kids. I went into my base, my basement room because uh-huh. we had a ranch house where, you know, we weren't wealthy and sure. I, uh, I just sat in my basement room and I cried and I just sat there and said, man, if I die today, I'm a menace to society. I was uh-huh. kicked out of college. I'm basically a nobody and it's time to make changes. So uh-huh. I, that's when I, that, that was the moment I decided wow. and then I, d- I did a sales job. I started a sales job, uh, not too shortly after because nobody else would hire me. And yeah. I was it like a hundred percent commission door to door deal. Right? Yeah, basically it wasn't door to door, but basically was. And it turned out to be really good at it. And long story short, I was running an office for a marketing company a year and a half later, negotiating leases, hiring receptionists, hiring and training receptionists. Like I didn't go to school for business. I completely and yeah. you know, God has been so good in that whole process. And then mm-hmm. I just kind of went from there. Right. So can you share a little bit about your journey where you started to build up your comfort in talking to people, being consultative, how you are now, um, and then walk us through how that shaped you into a franchise owner, which is a big moment, and then to publishing, uh, and also the community that you serve, which is in Clarence, New York. Is that accurate? Yes, we do for three. So again, I'm going to skip a lot of details because okay. I, want to make sure, I want to make sure this podcast is exactly yeah, what absolutely. Doing. I was absolutely petrified of public speaking. If I spoke in front of two, three people, my legs would literally shake. When I mean they shake, I mean they're visibly shaking. You know them, yeah. And so I, I, I turned to be really good at sales. And uh, my, my manager at the time um, was like, hey, Dave, you want to give a talk in front of the people? There's only like eight of us. You know, we can kind of see what's, tell us what's working for you. I'm like, oh, my God. And I literally said, sorry, every five, I'm holding the piece of paper. Yeah. It's wet is going into the paper. And I'm just sitting there shaking. It was like, you'd be like, what is going on with this kid? And, and uh, so anyways, I, so that was my first speech. And I was horrible. And then I, I, I would shake, seriously, for the first couple, four, five, six, seven times. We yeah. got a little more comfortable, a little more comfortable. Then eventually they hired me to be an assistant manager. And then I had to start running interviews, but I was shaking while running the interviews. But you just got a little better, a little better, a little better. Next thing you know, I'm doing it in front of 10 people, 20 people. Next thing you know, six months later, I'm running my own office. And now I'm, I'm meeting with 14 receptionists a week that I hired and doing W-2 forms with how to answer phones and how to do these. And now I'm, I'm now I have 80 sales reps working for me and I have to motivate them on a daily basis. So you really just, the best way to get outside that comfort zone is just do it little by little by little by little. Mm-hmm. And you probably turned around and were like, wow, I got 80 people underneath me. But during the process, you maybe you didn't even know the numbers were adding up, right? Because you were just so focused on I doing was so it. focused. Like, I, to be honest with you, I was just sink or swim. And for me, I'm just like, if this, if this, bit, so basically they gave me the keys to run an own office, but I had to find the keys. I had to negotiate the lease. They, they basically trained me how to run an office. Yeah, uh, and basically they're like, yeah, if you fail, you're done. You're done. And yeah. if you don't, well, you're, like, you're yeah, young. Like this was your first opportunity, right? Really? I'm and two, 22 years old at the time. Yeah, so 20 I, years I, old, you're, you're, you're having the moment of realization that you got to do something differently. By 22, it, it kind of reminds me right now as we record this, it's draft weekend. Uh, we're on day three of the draft. We're recording this. There's a lot of kids that are 20 years old coming out of the draft, not even sophomores, juniors, seniors mm-hmm. in, in college that, you know, are going from being working at probably a whatever job, right? 
if they have one to being highly, highly successful and being considered like a hero. But you know it's what? It's a crazy pivot. It's a crazy polarizing thing, right? But you know, and one thing I want to say is now that I handed like $4 million, right? So yeah. one thing I want to say is that if, if, you know, the entrepreneurs that are listening, I want you to catch this real quick, is that if you're not where you want to be at, if you're maybe it's financially, maybe it's employee wise, maybe it's growth or scaling wise, maybe you not want to be, this is a perfect opportunity to really ground yourself in your foundation and what you you truly are and what you want. Because I'm telling you, once you handed $4 million, if your foundation isn't there, we know what happens to those kids or adults that aren't ready for the foundation to grow. For me, I'm sitting here going, you know what? If I'm not, because we all know, like if I'm not really good with money now, or if I get $4 million or my business scales, it's not going to work out too well for me. If I don't have a good circle of friends around me right now or business owners or thinkers or a good group of people that, that, that nourish me, I'm eventually going to, so here's the thing I want to say. This is what That's I want to say. That's really a strong wow. statement. That's huge. It's huge. But here's what I want to say, though, is that yeah. money does not change us. It magnifies us. Yes. So if I magnify you, who would you be? Like, if you have a little bit of unintegrity, it's going to magnify that. If I have, if I'm not, like, if I don't have the greatest foundation, it's going to magnify that. And when you build a bigger house on a crumbling foundation, it's eventually going to fall apart. So yeah. if you're not where you want to be, I know it sucks. I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm telling you. This is a perfect opportunity to build that foundation. Perfect opportunity. Man, that is a highlight I've been doing. This is like the 25th or 6th episode. That right there is one of the biggest highlights on my show so far. Because it's so true. Like everyone wants the big success to happen soon. And it's silly to not, I mean, you better be looking to go there. You have to think it first and then do the actions. But it's super important to realize and I remind myself, and as you're saying that, I'm even I'm applying it to myself as I think about it, is sure, I know where I want to go and I know what I'm capable of doing. And I'm in the process right now of building my team to be able to do that. And I forget where I heard this recently, but it reminded me of it as well. A lot of people want to build uh, this massive thing, this big ship, right? Well, if a ship starts to go down, right? You try to turn it, the pivot that we're in right now at the quarantine, bigger businesses are having a bigger problem with it. Because turning a ship that's this massive thing takes 45 minutes to go 10 degrees. If you and I are in speedboats and we're making our couple hundred thousand dollars a year and we're super happy and building our families up around it and we get something we need to pivot, you know, you could you could do it in a speedboat, right? Um, so as much as it's like, hey, I want this big 10 plus million dollar a year organization, those guys are having a hard time pivoting right now where if you're making you know, hundred, you could, you can move, maneuver a little bit easier. Um, so that's like a second thousand, part, right? Cause you're not that committed yet. So if you hate what you're doing or you don't like who you are and yeah. sometimes we're that in our point of life, we're like you rebuild, you can rebuild. You really yeah. can. But when you have 40 employees and, and you, you know, you don't have time to master that anymore as much. So like you have to be, so for me, so foundation is everything, you know, foundation me, is everything. If you're not where you want to be right now, that's okay. Start building those foundational levels, get the people around you, think and read, spend more time learning, and then do the implementation. And then yeah. have some kind of checks and balances. That's the thing I always catch you myself like this. I know I'm even doing better than I was two months ago, right? Yeah. Did you have someone in your family? Um, I know, unfortunately, you didn't really have a father figure growing up, right? Did you have um, either through your mother or someone that you looked up to, whether it could have been an athlete or just someone you, you recognize like an inspiration from? Yeah, it was totally my mom growing up. My mom's a single mom of five kids, you know? So really in a span of four years, I saw my mom when I was a young adult, I was probably, I would say I was 14, you know, at the time in four years, I saw her basically um, go back to college while raising five kids, go back. Well, she was actually pregnant when she was in college with her fifth, with her fifth kid. So, um, and she was basically while pregnant, going back to school, finishing her bachelor's degree, while um, working three jobs and while actually after she had her, her uh, my sister, her, her daughter, um, she actually was fighting cancer, breast cancer. So this was all in a span of, I believe, four years. So seeing my mom work so hard, so hard, yeah. to, 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 you know, you know, there was, you know, it's not easy. Five kids under the age of 15 and no. you know, while you're pregnant with one of them. Right. And not easy for anybody. Yeah. Battling cancer, working three jobs. Like I just sat there and went, well, Hey, hey I don't want to do that in the future, but also in the same breath, I'm sitting there going, man, anybody can change their stars, man. Anyone, if they work hard enough and they have enough, I just, I saw that. 
And my mom was my, she has no clue, but she was, you know, she'll sit there and say, well, I was just doing it because I wanted a better feeling for my family. But that just really embodied in me. Mm-hmm. And I was not a hard worker in school. I mean, I got like 75 averages, you know, I wasn't motivated, but I realized that when I was really, when I really loved something, mm-hmm. I really put a lot of hundred percent into it. So anyways, I want to answer your you question. Learn that, you learn that through the influence that she was living. Right. Someone's watching you. You know, here's the thing. If the world followed you around, not every day, because we're not, not that you're perfect and no one be perfect. With, they follow me either. But sure. in general sense is if we followed you, will we be better or worse? Right. Exactly. Or will we be better or worse? And, you know, and I put in the date and, and, I, and it was like I did some relationships, things for college students. It's like it's like, um, you hmm. know, is your partner making you better or worse? Or you know, anyways, I'll just stop there because I'm not going to go into a different ramp. But um, no, I think that's great. It's a self-reflection moment for anybody listening to think. You know, we all want the 15 minutes of fame, but if we had, let's say we gave you 15 hours of fame and we followed you for half of an entire day, would people be inspired to do great things or would they be, where, where would you be leading them? I think yeah. that's just, let's just leave it at that. I think that's great. Yeah. You have two books out. One is called Never Complete and the other is How to Feel Empowered When You Are Overwhelmed. That's a great relevant topic right now. So can you talk about what uh, brought those two books about as an inspiration and, and um, are the, are they both available? I know you wrote them. They're, they're not like fresh releases. So talk about them a little bit. So the, my first book, a book I wrote was called never complete. I originally yeah. wanted to call it a work in progress, but I, I noticed that nine other books were called a work in progress. So I didn't want to be, you know, fighting with uh-huh. those. So basically I called it never complete. And basically that book in a nutshell is how imperfect I am. It's 108 pages. I call it all killer, no filler, like a Sum 41 <laughs> CD, right? And basically, I just talk about how imperfect I am. I basically just share everything I've messed up. And it's like, there's things in that book prior that I never told anyone. And I just said, yeah, I messed up here. Man, as a leader, I've messed up here. And man, I've messed up here. So the point is that, and, and, and it kind of goes into the second book, How to Feel Empowered Overwhelmed. I'm sitting here going, if I can be such an imperfect person, I don't have to be perfect to be empowered is what I'm trying yeah. to say. I don't have to have it all together to move forward. And I don't have to be mistake free to be mm-hmm. someone worth, you know, following. And for me, I just got, so for me in that book, in a general census is that Jesus's grace really empowers everything I do. And mm-hmm. for me, if, it, if, if my scoreboard in my life of how great I am is really indicated at how well I am and how great I am and how perfect I am and and, and just how many good deeds I do, I would have just been screwed a long time ago is what I'm trying to say. So for me, his scoreboard resets me every day at a thousand to zero, <laughs> you know, every morning, man. And so for me, that empowers me. Like sometimes, you know, we beat each other ourselves up, such as entrepreneurs, right, Mike? Like, mm-hmm. man, I failed here. And man, I, I treated this person not so perfectly. And you know what? I was in my best year. And man, the last three weeks, I just haven't been my best self. And mm-hmm. you know what? It's just, he sits there and goes, I don't care. My victory is your victory. Uh, it doesn't matter what you say or everybody else says or social media says. I just care what I say about you and you. I am you're yeah. a beloved son and you you have everything that I want you to be. So for me, that just empowers me. And that's kind of the basis of the book of man, if God could work and use me and I'm not the greatest person, man, look what he can do for you. And yeah. that's yeah, that's it. So basically that's awesome. I think too, you you said the word a few times, the word perfect. And I think we all kind of have some level of chasing something we can define as perfect or we see someone we think they're perfect and we're seeing only their social media version of themselves and it's not even a true reflection on the human being that we're talking about right we change the word perfect with purpose Mm -hmm. so you're thinking about serving with purpose and not just trying to solve to be perfect Mm -hmm. i never thought of those two words as like replaceable but every time i think of trying to be perfect at something i'm going to change it to in my head yeah. to have purpose behind it. Why am I doing it? Why is it important? You know, what per, what can I give? What value can I add to this thing? It's not going to be perfect. And that's okay, right? Yeah. But if we give it the most purpose, I, that is, I think, the most yeah. important thing, you know? And, and I just want to add one thing, if you don't mind, is, yeah. is that like, you know, for me, when I'm doing something, it's, mm-hmm. it's who I'm becoming that is more important than what I'm doing. So when I know who I am, who I'm created to be, what my passions, my gifts, like what I feel like I was created to do, like not having the whole picture figured out, because sometimes we just get a little piece of the puzzle and we don't see the rest of the picture, but it's like, you know what, I feel like this is my gift. I feel like God put me on earth to do this in this moment. I feel like when I know who I am and what I'm created to do, the, the doing just naturally happens. 
So for me, we don't have to have the whole picture. Just I feel like this is my little next step right here. Maybe the next step is, maybe it's like, well, I want to run a marathon. Okay, maybe my next step is just to buy some running shoes. Yeah. Maybe my next step is just get an accountability partner. Maybe yeah. it's like, well, I want to have some better friends. Okay, maybe my next step is just to remove an apathetic friend out of my relationship. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's to get rid of something. Often our next step is never to do something, but it's to get rid of something to create room for something better for us. Mm-hmm. So for me, yeah. it's like, it's not what I'm doing because the end of my life, nobody gives a freaking rip what car I own, what house I do, how much money I have, all these businesses I own. Nobody gives a freaking rip, in my opinion. But if they remember who you were. And again, when I know who I am, and who I'm doing is what I'm doing is, or who I am is more important than what I'm doing. Yeah. And really get that. It's just like the doing just happens. It really does. It just. It just brother, gets- brother, so well said. And what's funny is I actually have that as one of my questions. So my question to you to follow that up. It's a two-part question. Why do you do what you do, number one? And if you can be known for one thing, call it at the end of the life, as it's being evaluated, David Job did this, what would it be? Yeah, so the first, so say the first question one more time, I'll answer so that. Why do you do what you do at the end yeah. of the day? Yeah, what? You know, there's, you know, there's a lot of generic answers for my family, for, you know, because for me, one thing that if I'm just being real, you know, just real transparent, and vulnerable for a moment, for me, I really want to break family chains. So for me, things that I just wish that things were you know, different in my life or things I wish that, you know, I just want to be the one that does that versus complain it wasn't there. I really I want to learn from it, um, but I also want to break chains. And for me, I feel like that's one of my purposes in life to do yes. so. And awesome. sometimes monetary wise really does help that. But Sure. And I want to help other people do that. So honestly, I'm just taking a next step like everybody else. I, I guess I have a five-year, 10-year plan, a vision of where I want to be and what I want to do. But for me, if you, if I feel like God's called me to start an orphanage in Africa, I'm just going to go do that. I'm just, yeah. you know, let me go do that. I'm not saying that's what he has me to do, but I'm just using a really radical example. No, and I, I, I that's one of the biggest things I love about you is that um, you get it done. Like you start to solve for, hey, we want to do this virtual network thing. It's not an idea for next year. It's happening this week. David puts it out. It's happened by Friday. And you find the people, because again, it's not about you driving the bus and you changing the tires and you fueling the thing. It's it's like bringing the right people together. Um, but to answer the second part, if you can be known for one thing, what would it be? Someone just said, man, David Chubb, I know it's a tough question, but no, really, seriously. If it, you know, if you're, if you're if you was at my funeral, hopefully, long, you know, long, long time away. But if that's the case, like he just followed God with all of his heart, and that's really one thing that I just, yeah. you know, I'm just being real. I know it's not politically correct. I know it might offend some people, and you know, sorry but not sorry. But that's honestly, this shows all about being real. So you can say so, that's what's it's not politically correct these it. days. But for me, it's just if I'm at my best, I'm telling you, like uh-huh. this gave me a passion for life that no business. No, no, no relationship, no goal or title could ever give me. And I'm telling you, like, I was 24 years old. I was making six figures. I was going on a new date every week. I had two cars, winter car, summer car. I bought a house. And, you know, I'm just, I went on six, seven vacations a year. And I just sat there and I said, so I just do this for 50 years. This is what I do. Like, that, that's, that's life. Like, there's got to be more for this. And, and I just, I wasn't depressed. I just wanted more. And as human beings, we want the hundred percent, not the 98%. I just wanted that 2%. And I just realized I was going to get it out of what, what America or the American dream tells us we should get. And I'm telling you, like, I'd rather have very little in my relationship with Christ than a whole lot and, and not. And that's, that's really what. It- <laughs> wow. Uh, that, that, sorry if that was too much. <laughs> that is not too much. That is, that, that was, that was amazing. Um, Thank you for being real. Again, I said it. This show is about that. This is not about political correctness. I'm not obviously trying to offend people, go out of my way to do that. I know there's some shows where it's like they want the soundbite. I'm not that. Yeah. I am about being real. If you believe in God as I do, I want you to be able to talk about that. If you don't, I'm willing to have somebody even come on here, maybe tell me their opinions, why not? But whatever. I'm I'm real. I'm transparent as you are. And that answer right there, I think, is so important for us to realize I haven't, I don't have the summer car, winter car thing yet, but I I'm planning on having a nice financial freedom lifestyle. Right. But I do know, and I'm super mindful of the 2% where that you're talking about the fulfillment factor that actually, and this shows this episode is not about me, but I just want to share the reason I started as an entrepreneur was I wasn't fulfilled in, in a successful role. I was in prior working in, corporate America as a retail sales manager. Mm -hmm. 
a store manager. I did love the company and the products and the services and the people I was with, but the 30 year vision didn't feel right for me from a fulfillment standpoint. And I did reflect like, if God put me on this planet, is he put me in the best position? Am I doing what he would really want me to be doing and what's best for my family? And the answer wasn't yes. So I figured out what that was supposed to be. And I'm still figuring it out every day. Why? Because we're not perfect. We're on purpose. That was awesome, man. Those those are two highlights. You can say that right now. I don't have it figured out. I'll never have it all figured out. We don't have to have it figured out to move forward. We just don't. Who's someone that you find inspiration from, like a podcast you listen to, a book you read that you just said, man, I got to get this in front of more people? If I I could buy everyone one copy of a book in in the world, it would be called, it's a weird, it's a weird title, but it's an amazing book. It's called Follow the Cloud by John Stickle. And I'm like, if I could, if I could, You know, if I had a trillion dollars and you say, Dave, you got to buy one book for everyone's called Follow the Cloud. It is a game changer. Uh And it just, it just, it's just, I was like, who's the author? It's called his, the author's name is John Stickle, J O H N S T I C K L. It's called Follow the Cloud. It was the number one best selling last year or two years ago, one of the two. I'm going to grab that because I like learning new things and people that are influential and that I can learn from. Grow your think, right? What's one new skill you learned during the quarantine? Zoom calls. <laughs> so <laughs> Zoom calls is one, some, is one thing I think. And I also realized leveraging, you know, relationships. So for me, you know, we've really tripled our podcast following really in a month and a half. And mm-hmm. well, how did you do that? It, it's really because I did so many one-on-ones. Like you can ask my wife. I'm literally in my office at 8 a.m. Yeah. And I don't leave till like sometimes 5 or 6 p.m. And I'm just like, what do you do all day? You're not doing like your publishing business, being with business owners. I'm like, yeah, but I'm meeting like one-on-one with businesses. And I'm not talking like really amazingly. Like, yeah, there's some really big business. And then there's someone that just started their business 20 minutes ago. Uh-huh. And it's everywhere in between. And for me, it's like, once this pandemic is over and they open up everything, I'm not going to have enough time to build these relationships with people. I'm going to, uh-huh. everyone's going to be crazy. So for me, there, people are more available than they're ever going to be. If you can't, if, if, no offense, if that guy or girl or that guy or lady that you're trying to get a hold of for a Zoom call one on one, if they don't give it to you now, they're not going to give it to you ever. <laughs> I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> so people, I'm not saying people are, are, are sitting on the couches all day because I'm not. Yeah. But the point is that people are more available than ever. So that's one thing I've realized is leveraging relationships, giving people give first, kind of like we, we, we both love Gary Vee, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so basically I love that jab, 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 right hook. You just want to give, 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 and then ask, give, mm-hmm. give, give, then ask. So for me, I want to give, give, give. And I think when you do that genuinely for a month and a half for 20 different people a week, mm-hmm. they just go to bat and go to world, go to war for you, man. They really do. I think that's awesome. Uh, you talked about being one of five children and you're also one of two twins. <laughs> yeah, and my twin brother has twin girls. So no kidding. Uh, wow. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. So my so if you see me running around with four kids um, in East Aurora, New York, it's not me. Yeah, it's not you. All right. Yeah. yeah so tell me a little bit about that. It, it, um, the question I have here is you know, your twin brother Dan, right? If if you're here and being truthful, it, what's one thing that you admire about your brother, and one thing that always drove you crazy, and then. And then the second part of his, if he was to answer that about you, what do you think he would say? <laughs> so one thing I love about my brother, one thing that drives me crazy. Okay. Oh my God. What do I love about my brother? Um, you know, what I really love about, he's really my built in best friend. He really is like, you know, I, he's the only person that I've seen physically besides my wife, but really during this quarantine and, you know, he has a really nice home gym at his house. So we've been working out like crazy. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah. So honestly, he's my, I just know he's someone that like, we just, what's really cool is that like, sometimes he knows, we know how we think we basically have the same DNA. So a lot of times he was like, Dave, you're being an idiot. Dave, that doesn't sound right. And oh. that's one thing I love about one thing that drives me crazy. Um, I don't know, like growing up, we drove each other nuts. We probably went yeah. through like seven drywalls, a China cabinet. Like we were just two, six foot seven, basically gorillas going at it. And your mom's trying to chase you with a frying pan, trying to get you guys. to stop <laughs> So, so Mom probably won a lot of the battles, I'm guessing, right? She, she cleaned up. It really was until he left for the Navy when we were 20, he was 22. And mm-hmm. I started my business in Jamestown, New York, where, where I'm from, I'm Buffalo now, but I started my original in Jamestown, New York. And we both realized that all these years of fighting and trying to be individuals, because everybody's teamed us up together as twins, mm-hmm. we realized that we were really just best friends in the whole process. So really when he left the Navy for four years, and obviously I wasn't with him, when, when he came back from doing his service, that's when we we're like, yeah, we're not, we, we never fought really anymore. Like, yeah, very, you appreciate things that um, 
I think that's an, another really strong lesson is why uh, if you give a kid just everything, they're never going to have a full appreciation for it. And if you hold things back when they do get it, they're going to want to go crazy with it, which is kind of a scary thing. If you tell your kid, you can't watch TV ever. Like the second the parents are out of the room, the kid's watching TV. So you got to like teach them how to learn balance and how to appreciate. But you, you appreciated your brother after four years of him being gone. So then you guys came back and became bros and, and yeah. super strong. Uh, if he was to answer the question oh, yeah. of tell me one thing that, uh, you know, mm. that you're proud of with your brother, David, and maybe one thing that you did to drive him crazy. What, what did I do? I wish he was here, man. Cause I, I want an honest answer. I really yeah. do. You know, I don't want to let go. You know, I never bothered him. I'm sure I drive him nuts. So, um, one thing I'm sure he probably appreciates about me to go with that one first is that, you know, basically my brother is now a home inspector. He does a, he's, um, he was an electrician. For Lieutenant the- Dan, right? Was, is that the playoff of Forrest Gump? Yeah. Lieutenant Dan. Yeah. We love Forrest Gump. We love it, man. And uh, so he does Lieutenant Dan home inspections. And so really, really just, you know, Hey Dan, like if you really want to do well for this, like maybe you should go into business for yourself. So really he's, he's really taking off there. So he does home inspections and he does electrical work because he used, you learn, you know, he was the New York State electrician for the uh, mm-hmm. uh, Highway uh, Authority, New York State Highway Authority. So, so it's all under Lieutenant Dan home inspections umbrellas, but he does home inspections and electrical work. But I just really push him to, you know, hey Dan, let's do this, let's do that, let's connect you with these people, let's move here, and and so he probably really appreciates that about me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm guessing. So, anyways, and what drives him nuts is probably so me. I'm really Type A, and I'm like, okay, if I create this four-page business plan for you, I want you to do it now. Like I wanted you to do it yesterday, even though I gave it to you now, I wanted it done yesterday, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which isn't fair, right? So yeah. whenever I work with somebody on a business that I'm really close with, I'm like over dominating. I'm like, did you mm-hmm. do step A yet? Like, wait, wait, you're on step D, do step A first. And mm-hmm. so I'm sure I drive him nuts there. Yeah, that's it's interesting when you see twins. Obviously, you're physically close together. You're you look alike, but personalities can be so different as well. We're very we're very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, One message to leave our audience inspired to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams, which is my show mission. What would it be if you can just look in the camera right now and just be like, guys, and deliver a message that inspire them to be brave and bold in pursuit of their dreams? Man, right on the spot. Jeez. Um, (laughs) Okay. So one thing here is that uh, one thing I want you to know is that you don't have to be perfect. you You don't have to have perfect or have it all together to move forward in whatever you know you're doing right now. Mm-hmm. And anything that hasn't worked out for you or hasn't worked out for you or has worked for you, or hasn't worked for you, it doesn't matter. So I want to leave you with this. This is not as good as it gets. You mm-hmm. might sit there and go, Dave, oh my God, like things are going horrible right now. Nothing's going great. Everything that could have went wrong went wrong. Well, I have good news for you. This isn't as good as it gets. Hope is here because Jesus is here. But not only that, but you have a next step to take that he just wants you to take away things that just don't belong in your life or maybe a tech next step that do belong in your life. This isn't as good as it gets. Or you might sit there and go, Dave, I don't know what you're talking about. Things are so great right now. I can imagine things being better. And I'm telling you right now, even when those moments when I'm like, man, life is so good right now. I just hear that gentle whisper say, man, this isn't as good as it gets. So I'm telling you right now, I say the best for last for you. This is not as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Take your next step today. Yeah. And that could be applied to anyone, whether you're not where you want to be you're doing the things you want to be doing or you're highly successful. We talked, I think it was off camera about Michael Jordan because that shows relevant right now, but he, yeah. he was one of my influences as a kid, just that greatness factor. And even when he's winning championships, he still wanted more, right? The next level of his ability. And so I think that speaks to what you just said there as well Is there's always that, that little bit more. You yeah. Know? And like, what's cool is that we don't do more because, because we're not necessarily like, uh, I'm trying to think how I want to say there's a lot I want to say. show off right kind of a thing. It's uh, to me, it's like, you know what? You're working from victory. So anything you do is like a bonus. And I mean that in a positive way. It's like, you're just becoming who you were meant to be the whole process along. So you don't have to do it to prove anyone wrong, to prove that you're right. not a failure, to prove all these, you know, that you're, you know, you're, oh, I am, I swear I'm, I'm as good as I say. I'm, none of that, none of that. You are great where you are. But when you mm-hmm. take a next step, it's just helping you and people around you take the next step around them. Like I, I have a shirt that says, Next step leaders, we take our next step so others can take theirs. That's all you're doing. Mm-hmm. You're great where you are, but you know what? You're, you know, you're not done where you are. And like, there's just so much more for you, but in a positive way, not because you have to mm-hmm. prove anyone anything. So yeah, I guess I think just- it's awesome, man. I also added this recently to the show because my tag on all my emails and a lot of my posts is be great and be grateful. Yeah. You know, and what I mean by that is 
is again, the big great part is, is give everything you got. Like if you have all the tools and you got the ability to think a certain way and go and take actions, like that's what the world needs. Go do what the, like serve your world around you. That's the be great. And then grateful is reflect on that. Like, thank God for the great things you do have. And you know, the things that aren't happening, thank you for those too. Cause I'm, I, I must be needing to learn something. So that's mm-hmm. the be great, be grateful. What are three things you're grateful for? Oh, I'm grateful that my wife is super patient. <laughs> That's, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super grateful for um, just the gift of entrepreneurship. It really is like, I could sit there and say, well, I'm so talented. Who gave me the talent? I could sit there mm-hmm. and say, well, I take advantage of the opportunities, but who gave me the opportunities, right? Who gave me life today? So I'm just grateful for entrepreneurship. And I'm, I'm, I guess going to number three, I'm just grateful for life. I'm grateful to, mm-hmm. to live in a you know, not just a country that that's free, but how many of us actually feel free? Like there's a big difference between being set free and actually living free. So I'm thankful mm-hmm. that I'm able to just live a life of freedom and have a patient wife and, and entrepreneurship. Like this is like, it's a miracle. It really is. <laughs> so, so well said. Yeah. Yeah. Those are three, especially putting your wife first. That was a smart one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, people, you know, I think I was asking a different podcast, like, Hey, what was like your number one um, accomplish that you're proud of. I'm like, oh, getting you know, married to Amber. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So how I pulled it off is beyond me. Well, you're a good closer. I know that. We we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> she said I do. So there you go. That was your num- biggest sale yet of your life, right? Absolutely, man. Um, but, hey, we got a couple minutes here. If you want to add anything, please do. I'm going to give you a virtual fist bump. Bada bing. Dude, this is awesome. I love the Bills shirt, the hat. Uh, it's an exciting draft weekend. I like the first two picks. You want to talk bills for like a minute? Yeah, I like the picks, man. I like the defensive end that was projected to go in the, you know, top 20, you know, go in the 20th yeah. range. We got him a whole round later. And honestly, I'm Singletary in my dynasty draft. So I'm not happy we grabbed another back in the third round, but I know it's good for our team. So I can't, I can't expect them to go around my dynasty drafts. <laughs> what about you? I like uh, at first I, w- I wasn't super crazy about the defensive end. I didn't do a ton of research going into this. I, I'm going to do a shameless plug. I'm, I'm doing a uh, fundraiser for Leukemia Lymphoma Society and I'm raising money up to 10 weeks here into June. And so I did a draft contest and challenge. I was focused on making sure that was running properly. I didn't do a ton of research on the picks. But when I noticed that he was actually someone that a lot of draft people who get paid to follow the draft and actually talk about it. They had Buffalo taking um, our defensive end in the, the 20 with the 22nd pick where we would have picked if we didn't pick up Stefan Diggs from the Vikings. So I'm like, wow, like we actually got Stefan Diggs. We got the D end we wanted and we were able to take a running back. That was also kind of a first, a second round type projected running back. We got him in the third round. That's like two way plus draft picks right there. I'm yeah. on, on paper. All we can talk about is on paper. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Moss looks really, really good. And I know that's not good for your Singletary uh, dynasty. dynasty. Yeah. But here's a scoop. Like, Singletary's a stud. I didn't see that. And I've, I've been right on a lot of picks with the Bills. But I didn't actually like the Singletary pick at first because I thought we had other needs. I wanted a tight end right there. Or actually, I wanted us to take DK Metcalf. Yeah, I think he came off the board at that point last year, but um, I wanted us to do something to move up, maybe give up that pick to move up and get DK Metcalf because we didn't have Stefan Diggs last year and we needed a bit a, a playmaker. Yeah. Um, but Singletary proved me wrong. Dude could play. He's a stud. And I think Moss is simply that he's almost like a Mark Ingram. Yeah. So it's almost, and I'm not saying that Singletary is like Kamara, but I feel you got those two guys now, plus Allen's is. Allen's developing. He has three solid receivers. You got more excuse. Not, not that he, not that he makes excuses, but zero excuses this year. So I bought my bill season tickets. He's close to having zero excuses. I still think he needs like a super strong tight end target. Yeah, I Dawson want Knox. Dawson Knox. I'd be that guy. I, hey Dawson. I just want you to know, wrong, brother. I like you. Number. You got the look. Dawson Knox was number three in the NFL for yards after catch for tight ends. You know, what, an average what, of yards after catching. Not catching. He didn't catch a touchdown in college. How did that happen? Was it just like? Well, well, if you want to get technical here, they had DK Metcalf, they had um, AJ Brown, and they had another receiver who wasn't drafted that he year. On that team, yeah. He was like fifth on the totem pole. 
And um, so, but anyways, I'm really excited about Dawson Knox. I really feel like in two, three years, because Kelsey, Travis Kelsey, wasn't used for much his first two years. And then now he really blew up. So that being said, I feel like he's going to go that route where this year. I love Rambo. He's got the look. He's got the size. He he had some dropsy problems going on. If he, oh, can get that, if he can get the drops he's figured out, he is the guy. Let's be real. I would still like us today. <laughs> I say us. If Brandon Bean wants to call me, my phone's on. Um, <laughs> But I would I would like to see the Bills take another tight end. So then we have like not Knox could be the one. And then even Croft came in when healthy. He's very he's above serviceable at that position. Yeah. I want to just see another guy in there where we can put two tight ends on the field and just take care of it, man. Maybe we'll Dude, I want to see I want to see more than 17 points a game where our defense is sweating it out. I want to see 27 to 30 well, points. I'll tell you right now, if I saw Moss in the backyard and Singletary in the backyard, and I have like Cole Basie, John Brown, and D- Diggs, I'm sitting here going, and then Knox, who's, you know, you got to be aware of him. He's not like the uh, worst man in the NFL. For sure. And I'm just sitting here going, uh, yeah, what do you do? You know what I mean? Like, and how about do? this? Your quarterback drops back, all those guys move out, and, and Josh Allen can slide for 12 yards and get a first down. And that's where I want him to dominate. I don't want to see – the design runs where he's running into a linebacker after three feet. I want to see spread those guys out and he can just keep getting 12 yards every time. And you can't even touch him because he's going to run and slide, run and slide. That's when I think our offense is going to open up. Let's uh, we'll, we'll get a, we'll get Dable on a phone call here, a press conference here. I think, I think we do, We need to, I didn't like seeing us run DeMarco out as our number one wide receiver option. And throwing a double coverage. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a double coverage to a, like a five foot eleven fullback. Yeah. That being said, love what the Bills are doing. Bean and McDermott are the two two of my favorite um, front office members that we've had. Like had I actually uh, combo is super strong. Yeah, I actually bought my season tickets during the pandemic. Okay. So I I, I got my season tickets ready to go. So you got as long as there's awesome. a season, I'm gonna be there, man. Um, well, now that you bought them, they're they're gonna do it no matter what. They're like, dude, Shab bought the tickets. We kind of we gotta <laughs> yeah. do the season now. That's and awesome. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll go to a game together because I, I doubt my wife wants to go to twelve. So yeah, if you got room in your box, um, I'm I'll be happy to come up and hang with you. Sounds good, my friend. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate what you're doing in Western New York. Seriously, what you're doing is special and, and keep being you, brother. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys. Super excited to announce that Mike's Warriors LLS fundraiser is now live. The button is active on Facebook. You'll see that when I'm posting that you'll be able to click on the Donate Now button. Um, it's also active on my website as well. So if you guys are able to do that, I want to thank you ahead of time for participating and helping out a greater cause. I do want to be mindful, obviously, through coronavirus. Some of us have been compromised in our health. We have a family member or friend that we know that's battling through that right now. Uh, some of us have either lost our jobs or have been working in conditions that we're not used to. So uh, maybe we lost clients due to this because they had to close their doors, whatever it might be. I just want you to know that I am mindful of the current situation going on. And I completely respect if you're unable to donate at this time, or maybe you're hesitant to do that. All I ask in that situation, if you're not able to personally give is if you can share this with your friends and family, literally share it through social media, or just at the at the dinner table, talk about it. Hey, Mike's doing something for Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And you can get that information in front of more people. That right there is a, is a tremendous help, and I'm grateful for you doing that. If you're able to give a little bit, maybe half of what you were able to do before, whatever it is, we're grateful for it. We can do this $1 at a time. We're going 10 weeks here. The kickoff call last night, it was, there was just so much energy on it that people are um, overcoming some of the adversity that we're dealing with, and we're helping each other out. And I just see the energy that people have behind Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and also myeloma as well. Uh, Did you guys know that 40% of kids that are battling cancer, it's a blood-related cancer, and of those children, right now, if they're in a hospital, they're having limitations and some not even able to see their parents. I can't even imagine being in that situation. My heart goes out to all the families that are uh, impacted by any cancer, uh, especially blood-related cancers right now as this campaign is live. So I'm thanking you ahead of time for donating anything you can do. $25, $50, $100. Bucks. If it's more than that, seriously, I uh, appreciate everything that you guys are doing to help me. 
again, if you donate, also share. If you're unable to donate, please share this. Extremely thankful for you listening right now, giving me your attention for a couple minutes here. You guys can check out more show notes and information on each episode at mikeduppodcast.com, M-I-K-E-D, uppodcast.com. We're powered by Social Chameleon. You guys know what to do. Be great and be grateful.